This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Margaret Leinen. I'm the director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and we are very excited to welcome Michael Pollan here to the campus. Uh, first, I want to give my sincere thanks for the, to the entire Nuremberg family. Uh, those of you who have been with us before know that this wonderful prize uh, was named after Bill Nuremberg, one of the previous directors of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, and it was given by the family. And we're delighted that we have with us uh, this evening uh, Edith Nuremberg, Bill's, uh, Bill's wife, uh, Nico uh, and Caroline Nuremberg. Uh, Nico is uh, Bill's son. And Victoria and Walter Schinkel. And uh, Victoria is Nico's sister. Uh, so I would like to ask the entire uh, family to stand up and uh, let's give them a warm round of applause. Uh, since uh, Michael Pollan accepted our invitation to come to talk with us and to receive the Nuremberg Prize, we've had copies of his books on the coffee table in the director's office. And I was telling him earlier this afternoon that I really enjoyed watching the, the response to those. And uh, the response has varied from, you know, are you a relative of Michael Pollan's? <laughs> uh, to, um, you know, is, is there a food thing at, at Scripps? Uh, but mostly people have come into my office and said, you know, uh, I've been hearing about these books and I've had a chance to look at them and it, the, since they were out here and I think I'm going to get one of these and, and read them. And uh, probably the, the best endorsement came from uh, a couple of the uh, uh, campus members who said, I've heard Michael talk before and I'm going to be sure to be there again. And for everyone who gives talks, it's quite an endorsement to have somebody want to hear you again. So we are delighted to have him join us. Um, the awareness that he continues to give the public about the origins of our food and what it means to the environment, uh, what our eating habits mean to the environment, uh, is really based on, on deep knowledge. And we appreciate that perspective of, of having scientific research, understanding it, and still being able uh, to communicate a, a story so powerfully uh, to the public. And we really uh, look forward to, to hearing more about that. Um, the uh, here at Scripps, uh, we're very interested, to, or we're very involved in studying uh, many of the factors that are so important for food production. Uh, for example, water and water availability, and how that affects uh, food production. So we really see this as connected with the whole uh, issue of the environment and climate change, uh, that are so much a part of the Scripps story and the Scripps research. Uh, tonight we're going to hear more about the food we grow and eat at every level. Uh, but before we do, I'd like to introduce our Chancellor, Pradeep Khosla, uh, who is going to give us a few remarks. Pradeep. Thank you, Margaret, and welcome everybody. Uh, it's so good to see so many of you out here for this 13th 
event of the Nirenberg Prize, and this is one of the most prestigious prizes we give uh, at UC San Diego. But I have to tell you, it's not just one of the most prestigious prizes, it's one of my top three events, must attend events in every year. So I'm so glad that you're all here. So it is a great honor and a pleasure right now uh, to talk about Michael Pollan. But, but before you talk about Michael Pollan, let me tell you, uh, this is also the nerd in me. So I'm a computer scientist engineer by training, and so I do a lot of computer science. And I always thought that public policy, public interest, was really a critically important issue that unfortunately for at least three or four decades in this country, the public had no interest in science. And science had no interest in describing to the public why science was in the interest of the public. And this prize, I think, uh, does a very important public good by making sure that we award this to people who really push the agenda of science, but in a common man's way of thinking and addressing the common person so that every one of us can read these books or these works and understand the impact of science. And I myself was introduced to Michael's work through Botany of Desire, not because of what you're thinking. How many of you read that book? It's actually, a, oh, oh, come on, everybody should have read that book. It's actually a great book. It's a 2001 book, and until recently, I did not even know that Michael was at UC Berkeley, and I'm so glad he's part of the UC system. It's an amazing book. Uh, anyway, so, so what about Michael that we want to know? So I think Margaret said a few things. Let me add a few more. So he's revolutionized the way we think about food and farming and our environment. And if you have been keeping track of all the press releases coming out of the UC system, our president, Janet Napolitano, has made food as one of her big initiatives. And it's only literally an hour ago, Michael was telling me that that happened at Chez Panisse, which, but, <laughs> yeah, okay, you understand. <laughs> <laughs> at Chez Panisse, where Michael was having dinner with the president and a bunch of chancellors. I wasn't there because I'm true to my word. I was actually helping people conserve. So anyway, so, <laughs> so this is where, at Chez Panisse, they decide that food is really important. And, and we need to feed the hungry. And this chancellor remained hungry because I didn't go to Chez Panisse. But nonetheless, but Michael, you're joining a great crowd of people. People who've been awarded before you. Let me just read some of their names. The filmmaker and deep sea explorer, James Cameron. He was here last year. The genomics expert and UC San Diego alumnus, Craig Venter. I mean, without Craig, there'd be no uh, the gene sequence. I mean, he sequenced the DNA. Uh, newsman Walter Cronkite and primatologist Jane Goodall. So I think you could not find better company, and I think these people would not find better company without you. So I'm so glad that you're being honored today. Uh, now the people who are honoring Michael, as Margaret was saying, is the Nirenberg family. And I know we've already thanked them, but let me tell you, as chancellor, one can never thank donors enough. <laughs> so one more time. We need to thank the Nirenberg family for their generosity, for their support, not for UC San Diego, but for science and the public interest. This really is a very important thing. So please join me in thanking the family. <laughs> right? And it becomes more important because uh, Bill Nirenberg, who was the longest serving director of the Scripps Institution, was also a, a physicist, a nuclear physicist by training, but a great advocate and a great supporter of public policy and this whole notion of science in the public interest. So with that said, let me introduce a member of the family, which is Walter Shingle, who is the son-in-law of Bill and Edith Nirenberg, who will introduce this year's Nirenberg Prize for science in the public interest, Walter, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Pollan has shown that an English major can do great service to science in the public interest. And he's done this, as you all know, through his prolif prolific writing about science, natural history, and the politics of food. The animals that we, the plants and the animals we eat, where they come from, in time and space, 
how they uh, are raised and prepared to be consumed, why we cook food, how our national food system works in all its amazing strengths and weaknesses, even what the experience of growing or foraging your own food is like. Beginning with the botany of desire, and as a biologist, this is the part I appreciate the most, Michael Pollan places humans squarely into the natural world by showing that we and our plants are involved in an endless co-evolutionary dance in which the plants have changed us as much as we have changed them. Both parties are both object and subject in this endless manipulation. Throughout his career, Michael Pollan has always been an avid reporter at heart, searching out and collecting threads of history, science, psychology, and culture, and weaving them into a fabric of great nuance that is deeply thought-provoking. Perhaps because he is a reporter by nature, he has not fallen into the uh, trendy issue traps that have ensnared so many writers on similar issues. As a small example, his basic advice on what to eat is simply eat food, not too much, mostly plants. <laughs> <clears throat> His writings are too numerous to list, but you probably know them anyway because that's why you're here. His writings have both books and essays have run many, won many prizes. Uh, so um, the fact I want, the point I want to make finally is that uh, science very much needs writers like Mike, Michael Pollan to bridge the gap between scientists and a wider public um, to make science. Uh, meaningful, relevant, and accessible, and perhaps just, just perhaps to influence people, uh, to influence public thinking about important social, philosophical, and scientific issues. Um, his biography phrases it this way. He writes about the places where nature and culture intersect on our plates, in our farms and gardens, and in the built environment. These accomplishments make him a very deserving winner of the Nuremberg Prize for Science in the Public Interest. It is now my pleasure to present the prize to Michael Pollan, but before I do, I have another prize which is even more valuable. And you're probably the only, you're probably the only person that would truly appreciate this, which is I have two beautiful, wild, ripe persimmons from the best tree in Tallahassee. <laughs> So if, if you would come up, let me. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much. Oh, this is great. What a, this is really a humbling honor. And when I saw the list of people uh, who had won this before me, I, I really did not, you know, I thought maybe a mistake had been made. Um, but it doesn't sound like it. And uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm very grateful uh, to the Nuremberg family, to, the, to this university, uh, and to all of you for coming. And I, and I very much look forward to the conversation. So thank you so much. And thanks for the persimmons. While Michael's getting seated, I'd like to invite Tom Fudge to come up and join Michael on the stage. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Michael's uh, insights uh, through an interview and a conversation with San Diego's KPBS news editor, Tom Fudge. And I'm sure that many of you spend every morning the same way that I do, uh, getting ready to go to work while listening to NPR. And I think it's so appropriate that this award, which is for science in the public interest, uh, this awardee for science in the public interest is interviewed uh, by NPR, uh, who also it, uh, translates that science and the public interest to all of us. So uh, Tom has been with uh, about 25 years in the business. He's a familiar voice to most of you. He spent 10 years as the host of KPBS These Days program and has covered a range of issues and topics uh, around the region and is now the news editor of KPBS. So I'll turn to Tom now. Okay. Take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much. You know, uh, we, we were out there at the reception, I, and uh, I was talking with Michael, and uh, Mr. Prady Kosla himself was asking the question, well, when is going to be the talk? Well, this is the talk. Um, I guess I just happened to get 
to ask questions, which is terrific. I actually interviewed Michael uh, once when I was the host of These Days, and it was about six, seven years ago. It was uh, a great pleasure, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, Michael, let's, let's get to you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. What was <laughs> the road that took you from being an English major at Bennington College to being an advocate for food and the environment? It was a long and winding road, I have to say, and it's, and it's not one where I ever set out in a particular direction. Um, I was very interested in literature and writing, but, but really I was interested in nature. I mean, if you look at what I actually studied as an English major, I was passionate about Thoreau and Emerson and, that, and John Muir and that whole American tradition of, of wilderness, um, and that had a, a, a big impact on me. I'm embarrassed to say I didn't take any science courses in college. And I'm even more embarrassed to say I barely took any in high school. I, I, I came of age at a time where you could get away with this. And, um, you know, it was very progressive education. And I made some enormous mistakes um, in, uh, there was a brilliant botanist at Bennington, for example. And, who, you know, I didn't know that I would want that information at some point. I never took his class. I did take a Relativity for English majors course, but you can imagine what that was like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I, I, but it's a mixed blessing not having a lot of background in science. Um, I mean, in one way, I mean, I tell myself, and, and maybe it's even true, that um, uh, not being so far ahead of your reader is, is a good place to be. I, I remember my grandfather used to, uh, he was a jack of all trades, he did many different things, and one of the things he did was teach uh, clarinet and piano, and he, was, and he didn't know how to play them. And he would... <laughs> And he would, he was always just, you know, but he'd read the book and he made sure he was just one lesson ahead. And it, it makes things very accessible, I think. Um, <laughs> this is not an argument for avoiding science courses, though. I, I actually regret that. Anyway, my interest in English was, uh, was I mean, I was interested in writing and, and, and the, the prose of these, these writers, but also I was very interested in the ideas about the natural world. And then when I got out of college, I, I worked in uh, magazines. I was an editor for a long time. And um, at a certain point, we were living in Manhattan. This is going to be a long answer to your question. Okay. I, I hope you don't mind. That's all right. Um, and uh, we bought a, a piece of land in northwest Connecticut in a very rural town called Cornwall. And, uh, and it was this rundown old uh, kind of dairy farm, but just a couple acres left of it. And I planted a garden. I'd always been passionate about gardening. Um, I had my first garden when I was eight years old, actually. And I called it a farm. Um, I was grandiose about it. But I wanted to, you know, anytime I could get three or four strawberries together, I'd put them in a Dixie cup and sell them to my mother. <laughs> um, so it was a farm. And um, so as soon as I got to Cornwall and I had some land of my own, I, I, I you know, turned over the soil uh, the, the, and, you know, broke the sod and, and put in uh, beds, uh, double dug them, um, planted my, um, uh, my you know, seedlings that I'd got at the, at the nursery and um, was promptly beset by a woodchuck uh, that, um, D and I, I, I do want to tell the stories because it is kind of foundational to my work. Um, and, and this too I'm not very proud of. Um, but this, this woodchuck, you know, was just molesting my garden on, a, on an almost daily basis. And I, um, uh, I, I kind of got into a war with this woodchuck that I, I, I talked about in my very first book, Second Nature, which is a book about gardening, actually. And um, I, uh, I, I had the kind of arrogance of, of people when it comes to the natural world, which is that I was smarter, I had the bigger brain, I should be able to solve this problem really simply. And so I went, I read everything I could about woodchucks and I learned that they had burrows that were never gonna be too far from the source of food because they're virtually blind. And, and so I looked and I found his burrow and I, I think it was a he, I don't really know. And, um, and I stuffed it full of rocks and soil and I closed it up and, and came back the next week. It was a weekend house at the time. And, the earth had spit forth these rocks and soil and the, and the woodchuck had come out and done it again. And, and then I, I gradually kind of escalated in my measures because you get really angry um, when this happens. And um, I, I found a dead woodchuck on the road, uh, you know, roadkill, and I scooped him onto some cardboard and I stuffed him in the burrow thinking, 
<laughs> that this would send a message. And, um, <laughs> and it gradually escalated into what I've, I've come to think of as my, my horticultural Vietnam. <laughs> and I, um, I finally did something that um, a lot of people who think of me as an environmentalist uh, are surprised to hear, and, and you may want to take back your award when you hear this, but um, I had seen this uh, footage on the news about a new fuel that they had developed for uh, airliners so that when they crashed, the fires wouldn't spread so quickly and it would give people a chance to escape. And, um, and they'd rigged up an old 707 on an airfield and they'd put this fuel in it and set it on fire and they had cameras in the, in the fuselage and you could watch, it didn't work, this fuel, and you could watch the, the flames just shooting down the fuselage and just, and I was like, that's what needs to happen in that, <laughs> <laughs> in that burrow. And so I poured a gallon of gasoline down the burrow. And this is where the lack of science education, I think, really <laughs> shows. <laughs> or lack of physics, anyway. Um, and I waited for it to fan out in the, in the uh, there are a lot of rooms in a woodchuck burrow. They have a latrine room, a food room, a sleeping room, and, um, and I pictured it all going in there. And then I tossed a match into it. And um, I pictured the flames going deeper and deeper into the soil, because the flames have an attachment to oxygen. And the flames went the opposite way, right toward me. <laughs> and, and I was thrown back. I used to have a lot more hair. And, <laughs> and it, was, uh, it was just a, a, a profoundly um, disturbing moment when I realized, <laughs> what, what was I doing? But the reason I tell this story is that I then wrote, and do you have a lot of questions? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, uh, it's fine, keep going. My other answers will be much shorter. Now, it was because I, I realized what was going on between me and that woodchuck had many echoes of what goes on between us and the natural world and, and us in industrial agriculture, us and our arrogance that we should be able to control things and that our big brain should prevail. And, uh, and I wrote an essay about that. That was really my first piece of serious writing on what would become my subject. Uh, which is the engagement, uh, as Walter said in, in, in his um, lovely remarks, my, our engagement with the natural world. And that the wilderness tradition that most of us are steeped in as environmentalists gives us a kind of one, one set of, uh, one paradigm for dealing with nature, which is protect it, lock it up, throw away the key. And, it, and it's given us an amazing thing in this country, which is the wilderness park, you know, which is America's greatest contribution, I think, to world culture. I mean, no one had ever thought that the idea of preserving a wilderness and calling it a park, that was a bizarre idea to Europeans. Um, and it grows out of this literary tradition that I'm talking about. But that, that way of thinking about nature does not guide us when we need to grow some food, when we need to engage with the natural world. We need another set of ethics to take us there. And that really has been the subject of my work ever since. Wow. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. You know, sorry. <laughs> you, you know, I'm, I, Jared Diamond is the person I'm thinking of. I, I, I just started to think about a scholar who once said that the creation of agriculture was the worst thing. Biggest mistake, yeah. That was the greatest mistake in the history of humankind. And I'm starting to wonder whether you agree. <laughs> Well, I see his point. I think it's a very provocative argument. I mean, um, but if you look at it in the, sh in the near term, it was a mistake. I mean, people, we got sicker and smaller and um, uh, when we settled down and when we were healthier people, when we were hunter gatherers and, and all these diseases began and nutritional deficiencies because we shrank the diversity of our diet. But we don't know whether we had any choice in that. So, you know, mistake may not be the right I mean, either we exhausted the supply of animals to hunt is one theory. Another theory is that we wanted to um, have alcohol. No, it's true. Um, and that um, it's very hard to find fermentable sugars in nature. You've got honey and then, you know, it gets pretty, wild grapes aren't very good for this. And so once you learn that you can make beer from seeds and you need a lot of seeds, 
you have to start planting. Yeah, you have a very good reason to make grain. Um, yeah. It reminds me a little bit of your book, uh, Botany of Desire, because mm -hmm. you got into Johnny Appleseed. Um, yeah. Sort of got into that subject. Well, let me ask you kind of a scientific question. We're here at Scripps Institution of You're Ocean. not a scientist either, are you? No, okay. no. You kidding? <laughs> Uh, we're here at the uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, one of the world capitals, if not the capital, of research into global warming. And you have been quoted as saying, depending on how you farm, you're either sequestering or releasing carbon. What do you mean by that? Yeah. I think agriculture is a, is a very important part of the climate change, should be an important part of the climate change conversation. And, and I don't understand why it isn't more widely recognized. Um, but a, about a third of the, of the CO2 in the atmosphere now um, formerly lived in the soil. Um, not as oil or coal, um, but as soil carbon. And um, uh, it was released um, over the years, ever since we began plowing, basically, the earth. Um, and agriculture contributes mightily to climate change. There's a lot of debate on how, what, a, what kind of percentage, and it depends whether you include deforestation in these numbers, though I think you should include it, because the reason we, have, we take down forests is for agriculture. Um, but it's somewhere between 20 and 30% of greenhouse gases are produced by the food system. That begins on the farm with plowing, and, and that's significant, and, and the application of nitrogen fertilizers, which um, contribute mightily to climate change. How so? Well, to make synthetic nitrogen, you need a lot of, it's a high energy process to, to basically fix atmospheric nitrogen. So it takes lots of fossil fuel to do that. And then when you spread this, um, these ammonium nitrate on the soil uh, and it gets waterlogged, it gets wet, it turns into um, nitrous oxide, which is um, 300 times more potent than carbon as a, uh, as a greenhouse gas. To give you an example, when um, Walmart recently did, it, did a carbon budget to figure out how, how they could reduce their impact on climate change. They're very interested in, in sustainability, um, environmental sustainability. Um, they found that their single biggest contributor to climate change was not the, the, the shipping network that they have. It was not heating all the, all the stores that they have. It was the ammonium nitrate fertilizer being put on the ground to grow the corn that was at the base of th their whole food system. And that, um, so that's one. And then we have travel and we have food processing with the result that uh, it takes about 10 calories of fossil fuel energy to produce one calorie of food. That's an unsustainable system, especially when you think that it's based on photosynthesis. We should have a free lunch in, in food compared to anywhere else and anything else we do. And indeed, if you go back before the birth of industrial agriculture, you find that in those days, if you put in one calorie of fossil fuel energy, usually in the form of diesel for your equipment, you got out 2.3 calories of food. So that bonus, that is the free lunch right there. Um, but now we're going the other way and we, it, it takes 54 calories of fossil fuel to get a, um, a calorie of beef. So it's a big part of the problem, but what's even more exciting, I think, is that it could be a big part of the solution. And this is something I've been researching recently. There's some really good research on how to put some of that carbon back in the soil. Um, we know that organic agriculture does it, uh, that is net carbon positive. We also have just learned that if we graze properly, if we, if we, if we leave land in perennial grasses, and graze it in a sustainable way, rotationally, without too, too much pressure or, or short-term pressure moving it around. Carbon builds in the soil. I mean, carbon w got into the soil because of grazing. It was, it was the, the symbiosis of, of ruminants and grasses um, that, that leads to the buildup of carbon, um, which I could explain in more detail if you wanted. But, um, and the, and th so there have been some very interesting research going on. There's a project up near me. I live in Berkeley, and it, there's something called the Marin Carbon Project, where they uh, recently were trying to figure out how could you make dry rangeland like California's sequester large amounts of carbon. And they tried a lot of different protocols, and the one that was the most effective was kind of surprising. Uh, they spread a half inch of compost, urban, a city compost from San Francisco, over these rangelands one time. 
and it stimulated so much growth in the grass and so much microbial action underneath the grass in the soil, which is really the key to carbon sequestration is microbial activity, that um, the amount of carbon um, shot up and has continued to go up for five years after that one application that they started this process. So we have a lot of depleted soil that can't sequester carbon. And if you give it that inoculation of microbes that comes with compost as well as the nutrients, you can, you know, set this thing loose. And um, th the scientist who did this work has calculated that the city of San Francisco could completely mitigate all the carbon being released by the residential and commercial energy sector. Um, by spreading a half inch of city compost over all the lands that San Francisco controls around their watershed. It's kind of an amazing idea. That's yeah, very, so, very exciting. It is exciting, and, and obviously more research needs to be done, and this is technology that we haven't developed, how to, how to stimulate soil to take back that carbon and put it back where it belongs. But it's, it's a, I think it's one of the, uh, one of the more exciting um, avenues to pursue for research in agriculture. You know, something you said made me think of this. When you look back on the great scientist Norman Borlaug and his green revolution, uh, the methods he promoted may have saved hundreds of thousands of, of people from starvation. And when I think about what he did, he was uh, promoting hybrid seeds, synthetic fertilizers, and I guess I wonder what, what Michael Pollan thinks of what he brought to agriculture. Well, he did some brilliant breeding, and um, you know, he gave us dwarf wheat, which was much more productive than the wheats we had, um, and that was a, that was a, a big accomplishment. Um, but his hybrids only worked in a highly industrialized system. Um, they, needed, uh, they needed a lot of fertilizer, and they, and they needed pesticides. So it was, a, you know, like a lot of things, it was a mixed blessing. I mean, he produced a lot of food. He helped people produce a lot of food. Um, there were environmental costs. The yields did not sustain over time. Uh, the soils couldn't keep doing this over and over again. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I mean, the Green Revolution is a, is, a, is a very mixed bag. I mean, you can look at it and you, you uh, I, I haven't done a study of it, but I, I have read a fair amount about it. And there were a lot of negative consequences. Um, basically, it didn't produce food so much as um, commodities that could be traded on global markets. And, um, and this was a boon to some farmers, and, but it also put other farmers out of business and led to more urbanization and things like that. So there were downsides to it also, but um, the, the gains in yield are, were impressive and the, and, the, and the breeding project, the concept of, of, of basically you know, dwarfing wheat was you know, an amazing idea. Um, I think the future, the next set of important gains will come from, not from breeding, but will come from understanding the soil microbiome and manipulating that environment. Um, I think that there are enormous gains to be done. We're just beginning to learn about the relationship between plants and microbes. And it's just like we're just beginning to learn about the relationship between ourselves and our microbes, which turn out to be decisive uh, influences on our health. Um, and not just our health, our mental health too. Um, so that's, I think, the next Nor Norman Borlaug uh, will be uh, will be a soil scientist or a microbiologist, not a, not a seed breeder. Uh, I hear you're writing cookbooks. No. <laughs> so that's not correct. No, no, no. My, my, uh, my mother and my sisters have written a cookbook. And I've written the introduction. So if you search on Amazon, <laughs> you might see my name. Well, what is... No, what is not my, my mother, who, who is a, a, a great inspiration for my interest in food, she was a wonderful cook, she and my three sisters have just written a cookbook that's coming out at the end of the month. But I haven't written a cookbook. I get okay, credit for this so all the I, time. So. I must have been thinking of your mother. Uh, <laughs> so what, uh, somebody asked me to ask you this question. What is the wildest cooking or eating experience you have ever had? Wildest. Or, yeah. Wow. Well, the first time uh, I cooked a whole hog in my front yard <laughs> was probably the wildest. Uh, that was a very intense experience. Um, uh, and I've done it a few times since. And it's, I mean, it's a great experience. It's because it's, it's, it, it's a whole pig and you end up with a major festival uh, in the neighborhood. And uh, 
So I would have to say that was the wildest. And th that's become a kind of family tradition. We try to do that once a year. Uh, maybe what this person was trying to get at is, uh, what do you feel is your relationship with food today? I mean, now that you've spent so much time reading about it and writing about it, I mean, do you have a love of food? Um, or is that just your mother? No, 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 no. I have, a, I have a passionate love affair with food. And it hasn't been dulled at all by learning a lot about it. And I, I think I'm less self-conscious about my eating than a lot of my readers are. Um, I find that I'm, I, you know, I have, I think I've made a certain number of people that you probably know insufferable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe yourself, I don't know. Um, but I, I, I enjoy food now more than I used to. I mean, I was once upon a time, I'm in my 20s, I was a... Uh, I remember going out, I worked at a magazine in Manhattan, and I got, went out to lunch every day with coworkers, and I would have a, you know, a cheeseburger and French fries and a beer. I mean, I just can't believe I did that every day, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I, it was, um, I don't eat that way anymore. Um, but I enjoy food enormously, and um, I don't spend a lot of time agonizing over labels, because I don't buy a lot of products with labels. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I t we cook a lot. We use fresh food mostly. Um, and we shop at, you know, small markets and farmers markets and things like that. And um, it's not that complicated. But I say that in full recognition that for a lot of people it is. And not just because they're neurotic or crazy, but because they don't have money. I mean, to, to eat the way I eat, I mean, I, I, you know, the average American spends like 9.5% of their income on food, which is very low by world standards and very low by historical standards. And, you know, I, I spend a lot of my income on food <laughs> and, um, and I can afford to. So we have, I mean, that's, eating well is easier if you have some money. And, and it's one of the, the real um, uh, tragedies of the food system we have. That the, um, that the cheapest calories are so unhealthy right now, um, which wasn't always the case, um, but the fact is that they are. So, so my own relationship to food isn't, isn't that complicated. I mean, it's, you know, partly because I did all this research and I have my food rules, which, you know, are always ringing in my head. Um, you know, I have my, I have this set of policies that guide what I do. And the beauty of a policy, um, uh, you know, when people hear that I did a book of food rules, it sounds like legislation, and, and some people think of it that way, but it's really, about, it's, it's, it's personal policies, and personal policies, like, like national policies, are basically uh, algorithms to keep you from having to run a complex set of questions every time you have to make a decision. You refer to the policy, the policy kind of tells you what to do, as long as it's a good policy. So, for example, I could say, well, when you're buying um, cereal for your children, you should make sure it's less than 15 grams of sugar per serving and has none of these particular colorings and none of these particular, um, you know, kinds of grains. Or I could just say, don't buy any cereals that change the color of the milk, <laughs> which is <laughs> so much easier to remember. Uh -huh. And so that's a policy, not, a, you know, see what I mean? So. I have all my little policies, and they, make, and they make shopping pretty easy. Okay, well, hold that thought, because here's one question that we got from uh, one of the students who, were, who, who came here today. It says, and let me just read this, while some people are choosing to eat healthier, how can we change the government to make healthier food more accessible? Food subsidies for organic uh, small farmers instead of corporate monocultures, et cetera. Yeah, it's a great, that is the question. I mean, the food system we have is the result of the agricultural policies we have. It's not a free market creation, what we have. I mean, we designed a food system to, to accomplish certain things. Um, and this really goes back to the 70s uh, with Nixon's appointment of um, Earl Butts as agriculture secretary. Nixon was faced by this bout of food price inflation. Food got very expensive in the, in the mid, early 70s. Um, there, were, there were women in the street protesting the price of eggs and um, uh, grain because of the, a, a grain deal with Russia had, had um, driven up prices. And um, uh, so he wanted to force down the price of food at any, 
at any cost. And he, and he figured out the policies to do it. And we basically started subsidizing the production of corn and soy and wheat and rice. Um, and we did it in a new way um, that encouraged farmers to overproduce. In other words, to produce so much that the price would crash rather than we used to support the prices of agricultural commodities. Um, and we kept the amount in check with granaries and set aside land and that kind of stuff. So when we did this, we made uh, the, these grains, which happened to be the building blocks of fast food. I mean, the soy becomes the, 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 the feed for, for the meat, uh, as does the corn. It also becomes the fat in which all the fast food is fried. The corn becomes the sweeteners, um, and the price of soda goes down as a result. And so we, have, we are an essentially subsidizing this unhealthy food um, and driving down the cost of food across the board, which so you're, you're is a blessing in some ways. Are you talking about corn? You're talking I'm about talking about corn and soy. Those okay. are the two biggest, uh, and, they, and they, they, they occupy the same fields. They're in rotation for much, much of the farm belt. But you're talking about, because I think I read an article where you talked about this. Um, it, you're talking about the feed that goes into cattle. You're yeah. talking about the corn that goes into... Uh, corn syrup that yeah. makes soda pop? Yep. Corn is, uh, corn is at the basis of the food chain, of our food chain. Corn is at the basis of you. I mean, we are made of corn. I wrote about this in Omnivore's Dilemma. If you, if you did a, um, uh, there are ways you can tell that what the carbon in your body, where it came from, within reason. And corn has a very sp specific, uh, you can recognize corn, that, that form of carbon, because it's a C4 plant. It's more than you need to know. And so uh, if you took uh, a, a slip of your fingernail or your hair and ran it through a mass spectrometer, um, you would find as an American that a very high percentage of the carbon, and we are a carbon life form, as uh, Star Trek reminded us, um, <laughs> comes from corn. We are the people of corn. Um, and you go to other countries and corn is not as central. Uh, as it is. So yeah, so, and, and, and th we have been that way since really, since this period of, of uh, you know, uh, 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 from the 70s. And so we, it's very much in the interest of political leaders to have food be cheap, even if it's unhealthy, okay? Because, I mean, we've seen, we saw this in 2008, we saw with the, the Arab Spring, when, when you get spikes in food prices, you get political um, rest. You get riots. You get riots, you get revolutions. Um, and every political leader understands this. So they're willing to put up with a lot of negative side effects of cheap food as long as the price stays down. And this, in a way, is the biggest impediment to changing the food system because so much of what we need to do, let's say banning uh, important human antibiotics in livestock, okay? This is, this is one of the most obvious things that the public health community, that anyone who studied this question knows that antibiotic resistance uh, is being created on our factory farms right now. Um, and it's getting into the population and it's giving people diseases that antibiotics will not uh, deal with. The, process, the practice should simply be banned. All it's essentially doing for the farmers is speeding up the growth of their animals a little bit and allowing them to survive their brutal lives in, in these feedlots. Um, but would this administration, would the Obama administration do anything about it? Well, they finally, under court pressure to do something about it, uh, came forward with a voluntary uh, process uh, to remove antibiotics. And we'll see if it works. Um, it's unlikely it will work. Um, so why? Well, because to do this will raise the cost of meat a few pennies. Um, and no politician wants to be on that side. And it's hard, too, if you think about it as a political movement, if what you're advocating for, more sustainable farming, more humane animal raising, all these things will raise the cost of food. So that is regressive. I mean, there's, there's so many problems with that. And, and it goes back to this. Uh, we've had this cheap food since the 70s. And, and, and our society, our economy is hooked on it at this point. It's baked in. Um, so to do what we need to do in the food area, we're going to have to address larger issues like wages. I mean, wages in America have been falling since the 70s, right? I mean, in real dollars, families have less money than they had then. And the reason, one of the reasons that people put up with this is that the food was getting cheaper too. So cheap food subsidized the, the falling wages in America. So 
you, you can't just address the food system. You really have to address the whole um, economic uh, system. Well, uh, yeah, well, it gets complicated. <laughs> it does get uh, complicated. Uh, uh, I don't know if I want to raise this subject. Um, go, go ahead. Genetically modified food. Do you want to talk about that? I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, well, this is an I this is an interesting area where um, there is a there is a, a big scientific consensus that it is safe, um, and we are supposed to take from that um, the idea that it's therefore good. And um, I will, for now, accept the scientific consensus because I haven't seen any research to convince me it's that there is any danger, health danger, in genetically modified food. But science can give you answers to scientific questions. Science can't necessarily give you answers to uh, economic questions, social questions, envir and environmental questions very often. Um, and I do think there are problems with genetically modified food. Um, but they're not the problems that most people voting for labeling have with it, which is they're afraid to eat it. I'm not afraid to eat it. Um, I do think, however, it is not, uh, it is that they overpromised and they underdelivered. They made outrageous promises that this technology would help feed the world, um, and it, it, it is not. It's feeding cars, uh, it's being used to grow ethanol, and it's feeding animals. Um, and it's not growing any more feed than, uh, it hasn't increased yields, which was, a, which was a promise. It has made farming more convenient um, for large monoculture farmers. It has kept monoculture alive longer. It's, it's rescued monoculture. Um, is that a good thing? Well, if you're a monoculture farmer, it's a really good thing. Um, but we need to transition out of monoculture um, because monoculture is, is causing so many problems. But um, don't, you, don't you believe that it's worth it to create seeds that are resistant to certain pests, uh, therefore it can be grown more easily in places like India? Yeah, but they're not developing, uh, yes. I, I do agree, but that's not the focus of the industry. The focus of the industry is selling the most profitable seeds that they can come up with, and these are corn and soy, and they like to sell us wheat also. Um, and they hold forward these examples of the, uh, you know, the resistant um, papaya, you know, which saved the papaya industry in, in, um, in Hawaii. And these things are all great, but this is like point five percent of what they're doing um and they have these uh, poster child products that they love to talk about golden rice is another one um, but fundamentally that's not what the industry is about so they're trying to get us to accept gm based on um wonderful future promises but the, the present reality you know there was this term called um whenever you uh were critical of marxism you'd have to make a distinction between uh, marxism as an idea this beautiful utopian idea that was going to give us you know uh, equality and freedom and wealth and what we actually got which was the soviet union and china and that was called actually existing socialism well we have actually existing gm <laughs> and it's nowhere near as good as the promise if they can deliver on the promise, I'll be thrilled. Um, but I think the promise is marketing. Well, uh, we're a little short of time, but I want to ask you a couple, a uh, couple of more questions. Um, here I'll try to give you fast answers. Uh, okay, here, here at Scripps, another thing they're doing here is looking at ways to create sustainable fish farms, aquaculture. Uh, what do you think of aquaculture? Is that something we need? Yeah. Well, I should preface this by saying it's wonderful getting a, uh, an award from an oceanographic institute, but I really am a, pretty much of a landlubber as a, as, a, uh, as a journalist. And I haven't really looked at the seafood question in great detail because there's some really good writers working on it uh, who are my friends. Um, but I think the creation of sustainable aquaculture is really important for the future of humanity. Um, are we there yet? Well, I think we have pretty sustainable um, aquaculture with shellfish, um, and, um, and I think we'll figure it out. There are all these problems, of course, feed being the big one, that basically you have to kill a lot of fish to feed the, the, f the fish you're farming. Um, there is a lot of unsustainable aquaculture uh, that is repeating many of the mistakes of terrestrial agriculture with you know, the use of antibiotics, uh, monocultures, uh, you know, not dealing with externalities like waste, 
but without question, we have to figure out how to do this. Um, it's, it's vitally important to, uh, to feeding the world in the future. You know, uh, and this may be my final question. In, in the West, we have falling birth rates, but we still have a rising population. Uh, do you feel in your heart that we can protect the environment and still feed the world? <sighs> See, you asked a really big question there. Um, th that debate, how to feed the world, we have to look very closely at that question, the way it's framed, um, because it's, uh, there are so many assumptions built into that. Feed the world what? Feed the world the way we're eating now? Big problem. If, if the world wants to eat nine ounces of meat per person per day, which is what Americans eat, there's, you know, the World Watch says we need 2.3 more worlds just to grow all that grain. Um, that's not gonna work. So we have to think in terms of uh, the, the assumption you have to increase food stocks by 50 or 80% depends on uh, people eating what we eat and that that is gonna be an acceptable diet. It also depends on a few other things. That a third of what you grow is gonna be fed to animals. Are we gonna continue to do that? That um, a third of what you grow is going to be wasted at some point in the food chain. Are we gonna continue to do that? And that about 10% of what you grow is gonna be fed to automobiles in the form of ethanol. Are we gonna continue to do that? So if we can rethink the diet, if we can rethink waste and energy for cars, there is plenty of food. Um, we are now growing 2,800 calories per person uh, per day. You need about 2,000. Uh, that's for everybody living on the planet. We still have a billion who are hungry. So quantity is not the problem with feeding the world. So we have to look at, at equity. We have to look at who controls the land. Um, we have to look at diet. We have to look at waste. Um, and if we're willing to look at it and not just say, we like the system we have, let's just make it bigger. If that's what we're gonna do, no, we're not gonna be able to feed the world or keep wild places wild. Um, so we have some really hard decisions to make, but, it's, but whenever someone says to you, how can you feed the world with organic agriculture without GM, um, you press on that question. And by the way, who's we? We feed the world? I mean, is, isn't that kind of an imperial way to cast this question? Um, <laughs> As Tonto said, <laughs> um, you know, the goal is for, for the world to be able to feed itself. I mean, the idea that we grow all the grain and dump it on the rest of the world is incredibly arrogant. Um, industrial agriculture now only feeds about 30% of the population. Um, so helping small farmers increase their yield in a sustainable way, yeah, that's all very doable. So I'm very hopeful that we can solve that problem but we have, to, we have to frame it properly first. Okay, well, Michael Pollan, thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.